Well, look, good evening. Good evening to everyone here at the Blavatnik School, but good evening also to everybody who's joining us online from across different parts of the world. I'm Nairi Woods. I'm Dean of the Blavatnik School of Government. It is truly a pleasure to welcome you to the school to the tonight for this special occasion, but I'm going to leave the more formal welcome to the Chancellor of Oxford University, Lord Chris Patton. Nairi, uh, Steve Schwartzman, Vice-Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're about to hear from the distinguished panel um, how we cope with a dangerous world. Those of us who felt that we were living in a, the equivalent of a post-Congress of Vienna world will be um, delighted to find out how we deal with the dangers ahead. So I don't want to come between uh, you and them while they give us all the answers. But I just a couple of things that I'd uh, like to say, because we are celebrating today um, the establishment of a chair in global security um, in honor of uh, Dame Louise Richardson. Um, I prepared for this evening by going back to a heavily fingered copy of a book which Louise wrote called What Terrorists Want, um, which was one of my, um, I, I won't say I went to bed with it, but it was one of my small Bibles when for three and a half years I was a minister in Northern Ireland and then working on the Good Friday Agreement. And as well when I was a European commissioner dealing with uh, some of the problems of global terrorism. And the book is a reminder that before she was a distinguished vice chancellor, as distinguished as they get, she was a great teacher, a tribute paid to her by the mile by her pupils, and a great scholar. And what she wrote about terrorism in two major books, but elsewhere too, um, provided what some politicians found difficult to take, thinking that you dealt with uh, terrorists by increased police surveillance and increasing penalties and hanging and not quite drawing and quartering, but the works. And what Louise reminded the world of, not least in Ireland, was the political context for the terrorism that was taking place and the fact that terrorism invariably had its roots or some of its roots in not entirely legitimate concerns about political issues and issues, we would now say, issues of identity. And I think that was an extraordinary contribution to public policy. So I recall um, the second president of the United States, John Adams, saying in um, 1817, a piece, of, piece of, inf use of information which I just throw in to say, show that I know when he was alive, um, he said that um, while the world had advanced in the arts and sciences for, he said, three or 4,000 years, our study of politics and of uh, what politics could achieve had been at a standstill. Well, Louise is one of those political scientists who's, as it were, taken that as a challenge. And thanks to her work, thanks to her scholarship, from which we took her away for, for a few years. Um, we've learned more about coping with terrorists, and that was certainly true in Northern Ireland and Ireland as a whole. Certainly found out more about dealing with terrorists than we would have otherwise done. It's remarkable when pieces of scholarship have such an impact on practical policy making. 
So I'm delighted that we're marking Louise's seven years as Vice Chancellor of this university, a period of time when only Italy has produced more prime ministers than Britain. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, all the donors who've made this chair possible. Um, so, uh, Louise, this is, I think, the most fitting way in which the university can say thank you to you. And I'm delighted that uh, the chair is going to be here in the Blavatnik School, so brilliantly led by Nairi over the years. But thank you to all our donors. Thank you to Nairi for hosting the chair. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to underline once again that it's, it's our tribute to Louise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chancellor, for that. And a special welcome. I want to reiterate the very special welcome to Steve Schwartzman to Amy Sturzberg, to Karin, to Jenny, to others, uh, our special guests who are here, and to Oxford colleagues, William White, Tim Power, um, and to a very special welcome to Tom Jeevan and to Louise Richardson, the Vice Chancellor, who we're honoring um, with this chair. Chris has already talked about Louise's work on terrorism. The other book for which Louise Richardson is known as a scholar is a very important book called When Allies Differ. It was her first academic uh, monograph, and it was on Anglo-American relations in the Suez and in the Falklands crisis. And I went back to that because we're living at a time when the relationship between the United States and the European Union and the United Kingdom over the last decade has had a little bit of buffeting. And I think that that powerful book that Louise wrote um, based from her doctoral research really gives us some insights into how much is not new in the buffeting of that relationship and where it is that we might look for continuity in it as well. So, so just let me also thank you, Louise, not just for your leadership of the university, but also for your contributions as a scholar to what we know about security and how we think about global security. And I hope that you'll um, continue to help inspire us in this domain as we begin building this chair and a program in global security around the chair. We entitled tonight's panel, A Dangerous World, The Future of Global Security. And I don't need to say to you all that the world does feel like a fragile place at the moment with an economic downturn with the ravages of the pandemic still with us with polarizing forces of community weakening resilience within countries as well as across countries with the sharpening rivalry emerging between the world's uh, two largest military powers. We're very, I'm, I'm very delighted to bring a wonderful panel with four very different perspectives to you this evening. And I'm going to start by asking each of them, and I'll introduce them just before they speak, because I don't know about you, but when people introduce all the speakers, I'm then confused about which one I'm listening to. So I'm going to introduce them one at a time and invite them to just introduce the lens through which they see global security. So we'll get four snapshot views of global security. Now, I'm very aware that in this room, um, we have three very senior officers in the UK military, serving or retired, and a wealth of other expertise. Um, and, and so what I'd like to do after we've had the introductory remarks is come to you for comments um, and for your questions to the panelist. So without any further ado, what I'd like to do is start with the, the immediate issue. When we say the word global security in Europe at the moment, not in other parts of the world, 
necessarily, but in Europe. It immediately evokes Ukraine. And I'm going to call first upon my colleague Tom Simpson, who's an associate professor of philosophy and public policy, an eminent philosopher of trust, of freedom, and the ethics of war. He's been named a new generation thinker by the AHRC and the BBC. But unusually for a philosopher, certainly in this university, Tom served for five years as a Royal Marines commando officer in Iraq, in Northern Ireland, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And so he, he's been our eyes on the unfolding military strategy in Ukraine, and then stepping back as the philosopher the year, that he is to think about what the implications are for the ethics of war. So Tom, let me, let me start with you and ask you, so where are we? Um, or you know, where is the war at in Afghanistan? Uh, in Ukraine, I'll address Sorry, that. sorry, in Ukraine <laughs> even. Yeah, thank you, yes. Uh, thank you. So, um, obviously our attention has been transfixed in the last two weeks or so by the Ukrainian liberation of Kherson. And if I could just ask for, we've just got one slide, just a map of Ukraine, just to ground my remarks, if that could be brought up, please. Now, the withdrawal from Kherson, you can see the blue area there towards the south of Ukraine. And um, uh, to, two very quick points about this. The first point to note is that this was a militarily sensible decision by Russia. So they reduced their frontage that they had to defend and substituted that for a very defensible natural uh, obstacle, the Dnieper uh, River. And this has allowed them to focus their forces. One of the implications of this is it may be that Putin is beginning to listen to his generals. So up to now, he's been operating a long screwdriver. He may be beginning to listen to his generals. There may be evidence of learning, of the political system learning in Russia. The other implication uh, that come out from this, although the Russians withdrew, they, they withdrew because their position was made untenable by the Ukrainians. And this is consistent with a wider pattern that we've seen in the ebb and flow of the conflict so far. So what you can see in the map here is the blue areas are the liberated areas where Russian forces were present but no longer are. And there were four identifiable moments of liberation. So the first was the withdrawal from Kiev and Chernihiv in the early days of the war when the Russians realized they were overextended, couldn't hold that. The second was then around Kharkiv, the borderlands there. The third was then in September, and this was the moment where the Ukrainians on the field of battle broke through Russian lines, and then over the course of seven to ten, ten days forced the Russians back. And then finally, Kherson. So three of those four areas, the Russian position was made untenable by Ukrainian interdiction operations. So on the ground or remote fires with the HIMARS weapon systems made the Russian situation untenable. Why am I highlighting this? We're going to see a much more protracted campaign in all likelihood in the coming time. So far, most of the action, the intense fighting has been to the east in the area between Donetsk and Luhansk. But the question that will arise is whether the Ukrainians would seek to break the Russian land bridge and drive south from Zaporizhia down to the coast. So you can see Mariupol, which is obviously engraved in people's minds from the heroic defense of the steelworks. There's a city called Melitopol further west from there where a number of roads converge. And Melitopol is the city to watch out for in the future. So in the coming spring, if the Ukrainians seek to take Melitopol and are successful in that, what they will do is they will create very significant pressure on Crimea. And the campaign will have a very, very different hue at that point. So that's the, that's the military picture. There's a long way to go at the moment. The momentum is clearly with the Ukrainians. What I'd like to do, however, is just draw three substantive lessons for the security architecture that I think will emerge from out of the Ukraine conflict. The first is this. We have witnessed the effectiveness of the nuclear deterrent. The old paradox that weapons that are capable of ending world civilization can have a pacifying effect on war. Right at the forefront of many strategic policymakers' attention from February is how do we make sure that this conflict does not escalate beyond Ukraine? 
the moment war starts, there's an inherent escalatory dimension. There's an inherent sense that, okay, they've done that. How do we, how do we respond to that? And before you know it, the situation is out of control. Both sides have escalated up to the point where the two nuclear umbrellas touch, but they do not overlap. NATO, US forces ha do not have, have not engaged in combat operations in Ukraine and will not do so because of the Russian nuclear deterrent. Russia has, has, uh, has acted only in the borders of Ukraine, and there's no indication that they will go beyond that into Poland, other Central and Eastern European countries, again, because of the nuclear deterrent. So I think for the foreseeable future, as the world enters into a more fragile state, the nuclear deterrent seems like a likely feature of our security architecture. That's the first point. Secondly, how does this end? We're beginning to see discussion, rightly, about what a negotiated settlement would look like. The challenge this position faces is that there is no evidence that Putin's maximalist ambitions for the reunification, in his terms, of Ukraine with Russia have faded. That was the operational design from the start. The operational design was take Kiev and subsume Ukraine, or at least half of Ukraine, into Russia. There's no evidence that he's given up on those ambitions. What are the implications of that? From the Ukrainian perspective, any treaty should be viewed only as a ceasefire. They have no assurance that the Russians will not seek to come back at some point and resume the conflict when they have reamassed their forces. So from the Ukrainian perspective, in order to credibly enter into a treaty, to de facto give away territory, maybe they do not abandon the de jure claims of sovereignty, but de facto accept some kind of ceasefire, it's rational for them to do so only if they have very, very robust security guarantees from the US and from NATO. So these will be security guarantees equivalent in force, I think, to Article 5, even if in name Ukraine is not admitted to NATO, which would be a red line for Russia. So the question for capitals, uh, particularly in NATO countries in the US, is, is that a security guarantee that those capitals are willing to give. And the third point, just very briefly, what we're now seeing is that industrial capacity is a core national security, uh, dimension of national security. Russia is down to a month's worth of artillery ammunition by some reports. They are dependent on allies now for, uh, for weapons, Iran most obviously, and this is distorting their diplomatic relationships. So for countries that seek to be able to act to deter conflict, deter future invasion by actors such as Russia, the capacity to sustain a campaign for a year, for two years, requires an industrial base that can equip those militaries. And that is a fundamental policy question that um, ministries in, uh, in countries across the world will have to face. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, any questions from the audience or, or comment on what we just heard? Is that a question from Chris? Can I just ask one question? Um, is Ukraine joining the EU a red line for Russians? Is Ukraine joining the EU a red line for Russians was the question. So uh, I, don't have crystal, am I, I don't have a crystal ball for the thinking in the Kremlin. Um, it doesn't have the same uh, fire about it that NATO does because the EU, EU membership doesn't come with security guarantees. In, in, the, in the same sense. Uh, but the question of, if you like, the cultural unification, which, um, uh, which membership of the EU may symbolize and may prepare the way for, is clearly something that Putin is uh, very, very concerned about and has been a driving factor. Um, so I don't know whether that will turn out to be a red line in negotiations, but um, yeah, so we'll see. One other question, and then I'll move to the, the next panelist. Yes. Thank you. Chris. repeating for the people online. Uh, so will, will the um, nuclear deterrent that Tom's described 
lead to nuclear proliferation? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I mean, the question we have to ask is, all things considered, what is the effect of continued possession of nuclear weapons? And um, in one sense, the choice for those countries which already possess nuclear weapons is, do we retain or do we abolish? But it's actually not quite as binary as that, because what is the associated arms control regimes that we might seek to operate, uh, in, in, engage in? I mean, my own prediction for what it's worth, others may differ here, is that we're going to see increasing pressure for a two-block world of some kind, where countries that don't already possess nuclear weapons may either seek to possess them or, more cheaply, come under someone else's nuclear umbrella. And I think there will be inherent pressure towards that. Great. Well, let me now move us to um, a related dimension of global security, which is international law. And who better to turn to to think about what role does international law play in global security than Dapo Akande, Professor of um, Public International Law and Public Policy here at the Blavatnik School. The world has something called the International Law Commission, a body created by the United Nations to develop and codify international law. It basically brings together the world's 34 most eminent international jurists. DAPO has just been elected to that body. He is the first ever to be elected by countries from four different United Nations groupings. So not only has he been elected to the International Law Commission, but with an unusually wide support from across the United Nations family. DAPO is well known to British government officials, to US, to, to British government, foreign office, and military officials, as well as to parliamentarians, as a constant um, advisor. Um, and for those of you who do want to keep up on international law after tonight, do look at the EJIL blog and podcast, which uh, DAPO is a driving force behind, helping others to understand the role that international law can play. So DAPO, tell us, what role for international law in global security? Thank you very much, Nairi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually going to follow on from what Tom has been talking about, and I'm going to speak about the role that international law plays in global security by focusing really on the role that international law can play in a crisis such as the one that we see in Ukraine. The situation that we have is one where one of the fundamental rules of international law has been broken. This is the prohibition of the use of force, which is really the core rule that we have in the UN Charter. It's not just been broken, but it's been broken by one of the great powers. It's been broken by a permanent member of the Security Council, the United Nations Security Council. And the United Nations Security Council is the body which, to quote the Charter, is supposed to have primary responsibility for maintaining international peace and security, but that body is paralyzed and unable to contribute to the maintenance of international peace and security in this situation. On top of that, we turn on the news and we hear reports of violations of the law of armed conflict, war crimes, torture, attack on civilian objects, more or less every day. And so that raises the question, what role can international law play in a situation such as this? And I'm following Tom not just in speaking about Ukraine, but Tom had three points, so I will also try to make three points. <laughs> I think three is a good number. So point number one, international law plays a role in either legitimizing or delegitimizing actions that states are taking. And if we look at Ukraine, we see it actually from the very first moment of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So on that night, on the 24th of February, we had the speech by Putin announcing the actions in Ukraine. And of course, well, I say of course, in that speech, Putin set out various justifications for the actions that he was taking, maintained that these actions were consistent with international law, and has continued to do so. By contrast, you have other countries, primarily Western countries, consistently maintaining that those actions are a violation of fundamental rules of international law. And what both sides are trying to do is essentially try to claim the high ground. And international law plays a role in trying to claim that high ground. Ukraine, in its part, 
in order to try to emphasize the gravity of the breach of international law has gone to the International Court of Justice, it's gone to the European Court of Human Rights, to try to have as objective as possible a decision that these actions are in breach of these rules of international law so that it's not just a question of Ukraine has said, Russia has said, the US has said, but to try to have as much as possible an objective and authoritative determination of what international law says. So that's the first point. The second point is that international law plays a role in coordinating behavior. So very often we think about legal rules in terms of whether there has been a violation or whether there has been a breach. And in a situation such as we have in Ukraine, we say, look, violation of a fundamental rule of international law, not much seems to be happening. We throw our arms up and we say, well, the law has no role to play. It, um, there's nothing to do here or to see here. But in my view, international law actually has a broader role to play beyond establishing that there has been a breach. And that role is about coordinating behavior in reaction to the violation. In other words, the fact that we have rules makes it easier to coalesce around responses to violations of those rules. The easier it is to establish that something is a violation, then the easier it might be to bring others around to respond to that violation. Essentially, it's about trying to um, work out the distinction between what is not merely harmful, but what is also wrongful. And an example that I often give, I know Kieran's gonna talk about this area later on, are the rules that we have around responses to actions in cyberspace. This is an area where the law can be uncertain and where it's not quite clear whether the activities of states are not merely harmful but also wrongful. And we've had situations where harmful behavior takes place but because of the lack of clarity as to whether or not states have crossed certain red lines, it inhibits the possibility to take action as a coalition to respond to those, to those harmful uh, actions. And related to the point around the clarity of the rules, whether the rules exist or not, is, a, is the point about consistent application of the law. To the extent that the law is not consistently applied, it also inhibits the ability to respond to violations of the rules. One of the things that Russia has consistently tried to do in this crisis is to maintain not only that its actions are not wrongful, but also to maintain that its actions are not dissimilar to the actions of other states. So there's a charge of selective application of international law. In June, I was invited to brief the UN Security Council on the question of accountability for violations of international law. And perhaps the most interesting speech was actually, and perhaps even the most effective one, was the action of the, the speech of the Russian ambassador at the UN, where he set out a number of circumstances where the US, the UK, and others had done things which, in his view, were not dissimilar to what was going on in Ukraine. And it was really interesting just to observe the body language of the other ambassadors in the room, those from Africa, those from Asia, who paid a lot of attention actually to this point. So questions around selective application make it more difficult to coalesce around responses to um, violations of the law. The third point and the final point that I would like to make about the application of international law is that it provides a framework for assessing what is permissible, or not in reaction to the kind of crisis that we see in Ukraine. So what has been the principal tool for assessing, uh, the principal tool that the West has been using to respond? So two things in relation to, to Ukraine. So obviously supply of weapons and military equipment to Ukraine, and secondly, the imposition of economic sanctions. In both of those cases, they have generated significant questions around international law. So first of all, what is the line beyond which supply of support to Ukraine 
constitutes the states that are providing that support as a party to the conflict. So to what extent does provision of arms and ammunition and intelligence, does that take you over the line? So it's a framework for assessing what you can do, can't do. And then with respect to sanctions, there's been a really interesting discussion around the extent to which not only can you freeze the assets of Russian nationals and the Russian state, but the extent to which you can actually seize those assets for the purposes of providing compensation. You might have seen in the um, news, actually just on Monday, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution that provided for the establishment of a compensation mechanism. And again, one of the key questions that has arisen there is, when do you cross the line with respect to the seizure of assets of other states? And in those discussions, simply for the purposes of self-interest, states have been very careful to try to work out the point at which they cross the line with respect to the immunity that state assets normally have. So just as with Tom and his three points, those are three points. But Dapo, can, yeah. I, can I get you to commit yeah. a bit more here? I mean, some people in the room might be thinking, OK, but is there anything you can point to? Is there any way in which international law has actually restrained either the actions of Russia or the actions of Ukraine or its allies in this war? What would you say? I'd go back to the examples that I have just, um, that I've just given. So if I start, first of all, with respect to others who are responding to Russia's violations. So the examples that I've just given you around the extent to which sanctions go. In other words, to what extent do you not only freeze assets, but can you actually seize them? Those have been discussions that have been heavily dominated by questions of international law, mm -hmm. questions around how far actually can you, can you go. Mm -hmm. And even with respect to, um, to, to Russia's actions, so my point is that very often we assess it just in terms of, well, is it constraining particular behavior? That's important, and that's what we want to, that's what we want to see. But it's actually thinking about the, 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 the sort of broader framework that one is thinking about. So the extent to which Russia and others are able to, well, Russia in particular I'm thinking about, the extent to which Russia is able to rely on the support of other states is dependent on the extent to which, to some extent, to some extent dependent on the extent to which Russia is able to convince those states that the things that it is doing are consistent with international law. And that's precisely what the Russian ambassador was trying to do in the UN Security Council, to try to say to you know, India and African states that they want actually to continue to buy their oil, mm -hmm. to say what we're doing is not inconsistent, not unlawful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my colleagues are inching you towards, hopefully, a feeling of slightly greater safety in this fragile world. Tom's account of the way in which military constraints and restraints themselves can hold some security, and DAPO's account of the way international law provides a way for countries to come together and equally to exercise some restraint over conflict itself. I'm going to turn now to Nita Crawford, um, sitting here on my right. Nita is the Montague Burton Chair in International Relations here at Oxford in the Department for Politics and International Relations. Nita is phenomenally well known in the world of international relations for her, a project she launched in 2010 on the costs of war. And that project um, uh, is being used by scholars around the world. Her most recent book called The Pentagon, Climate Change and War, um, ranked in the US as one of the four most solution-packed books on climate change. I like that description. Um, and a book that's been brilliantly reviewed from the New York Review of Books to Science, uh, The New Scientist. A book that reminds us and tracks the way the Department of Defense in the United States has accepted that climate change is a huge risk to US bases, to security, and yet, it's the largest emitter in the world. I might be getting it wrong, but that, that's what I took uh, from, uh, fr from the book. So let me turn to Nita and um, to, to give us a sense of 
how and why climate is a threat to global security? I think climate change is accelerating, exacerbating, and connecting all the crises that you first mentioned. So climate change is increasing economic inequality, um, and inequality is already rising. Uh, the world is at risk of um, stalling and maybe not meeting the sustainable development goals. Uh, it's uh, at issue in what we're seeing as a hegemonic, a moment of hegemonic transition um, where it matters whether or not the U.S. and China are actually cooperating on emissions reductions. Um, it's uh, uh, going to accelerate, I think, as countries react to, to climate change, military spending, which last year reached $2.1 trillion, and uh, that's after seven years of steady growth. So um, I think it's also implicated in pandemics in the sense that many pandemics are zoonotic, meaning that they're uh, jumping from uh, animals to humans. So as humans um, shift and migrate due to climate change, they'll be in increased contact. And so diseases like Ebola, like um, bird flu, like COVID may become, and the science says, um, more frequent and will be more stressed. So climate change is exacerbated and implicated in these crises and connecting them. So that's the first point. And the second point I, I want to stress is that yes, militaries are important contributors to emissions. It, it is the case that the US military's emissions last year um, were five point, I'm sorry, 51 million metric tons CO2 equivalent. So um, that's only 1% of the United States' total emissions, but the United States is the number two emitter in the world. It is the largest single emitter in the US government, it's the largest single emitter in the United States, and it is the single largest institutional emitter in the world, yes, and its emissions are at that level greater than many countries, um, certainly greater than Sweden, um, Portugal, other countries you could think of, many, many countries. Um, that, that's a, a point about the scale of emissions. And as Zelensky said at COP27 last week, climate change is caused by war. War is causing climate change. So it's not just the, the everyday emissions, it's the activities during war. In particular, you know, and Zelensky mentioned the five million acres of forest that were just, have been destroyed in that, the Ukraine war so far. But it's also the case that um, Climate change, uh, when cities are destroyed and then eventually rebuilt, increases emissions. I'm sorry, that war increases emissions. And um, the other thing that one has to keep in mind is that the, the, the use of nuclear weapons, which has been uh, mentioned as on the table, I don't know if there will actually be nuclear weapons and, ex and hopefully not um, an escalation, but the use of nuclear weapons, several hundred of them, on cities would cause climate change. Um, it would cause a dramatic decline in global surface temperatures. So war is implicated and the preparations for war uh, are implicated in causing climate change. Now, militaries are also, third point, very concerned that climate change will cause instability and war. And yes, that's possible. NATO will be starting next year a new center for the study of, of the relationship between climate and security. I think this is a welcome development, but there's a, a danger in suggesting that the relationship between climate change and conflict is uh, both linear and uh, uh, unmediated by other factors in, in this sense. What's most important in the relationship between climate change and conflict, I think, is whether uh, there's governmental capacity to respond to tensions and stress um, in you know, regard to uh, crises driven by extreme weather or with um, refugee flows. But the idea that climate change caused war is coming to a neighborhood near you is going to exacerbate um, uh, military spending, 
which is directly correlated with military emissions. And this can become, as I said, a reinforcing cycle. So I'm, I'm concerned about that, though I think we need more research on that. And, and that's why I think this chair is quite important. Thank you. Nita, I wonder, with, um, without putting him at all on the spot, if I could ask um, Patrick Sanders, General Patrick Sanders, who's right here, to, and, and who is um, Chief of the General Staff in the UK military. Um, but you developed Britain's integrated review and strategic command papers. And I just wondered if, if on this issue of climate change, do you have any reflection? I saw you both nodding and looking quizzical during that. I'm not picking on you at all, but... Um, I, th I think you are. If, if, where, does, where does climate change fit in your view of Britain's military strategy? So first of all, let me not claim any authorship for the integrated review. Um, I was one of a number of chiefs at the head of defence. I was involved in it, but not exclusively responsible for it. Um, and we're wrestling with precisely what, uh, what Netta was describing, um, both climate change as a, as a cause of, of conflict, um, but also our own contribution to climate change. So the largest emitters, generally speaking, are um, in the air and the maritime sectors. Um, and there is some really interesting work being done around synthetic fuels, which begins to get after uh, air emissions harder with maritime. Um, and in, on the land sector, it tends to be the estate uh, rather, than, rather than vehicles themselves. And so we're pursuing all the sort of strategies that you would expect to try to reduce our carbon footprint uh, and our emissions. But when I tell you that the single largest emitter on the defence estate is a place that Chris Deverell and I were responsible for, which is a power plant in Cyprus, and that's a location that's not short of sunshine, it tells you just how far we have to go. So um, climate change as a, as a driver of instability is something that, that we recognize. Um, and um, defense has a, a zero uh, uh, emission strategy, but it's fair to say that given the bandwidth, and this is Netta's point, the bandwidth that the current conflicts and the current threats are consuming, my nervousness is that it doesn't continue to secure the sort of prioritization it needs. And we saw in the government's budget just this week how some of those things were starting to fall away. Thank you very much. Great answer for an ambushed member of the audience. <laughs> um, no, really terrific. Any questions, comments on what you've, you've heard so far? Yes. Can Pepper I Culpepper. Pepper. So, Dapo, I wanted to push you on the, the, the point you made about um, the first point was how everyone's seizing on international law and then how they're coordinating around international law. Uh, and to see if you can sort of disprove an alternative view, which is war is just being, uh, uh, the international law is just being used in this war as a sort of a form of rhetoric. Uh, and so the Russian ambassador was very good at it. And what was the Russian ambassador able to do? He was, he was trying to appeal to a large group of countries that didn't want to take a side. And they didn't want to take a side because international law wasn't you know, determining their outcome because they were thinking about where their interests lay. Um, and so where does the role of law in understanding what's going on and dictating what's going on uh, stop and the role of power politics start? So it's a good question. I mean, there's a word that you use there, which is that you said international law is not determining what's going on. And I hope I didn't give the impression that it's determining what's going on, because I think that would certainly be overselling the claim. The question, at least the way that I tried to put it, was whether it had a, a role. And I don't see this necessary tension between um, sort of things that are actions based on your interests and international law actually having a role to play, perhaps even in constituting what your interests are. So it has a role to play, for example, in, you know, it may not determine the actions that you take, but it determines the views, of, or, not, or contributes, sorry, contributes to the views of others, which helps actually to constitute what your interests might be in particular situations. So to me, it's not a, you know, it's not a case of you're either acting because of international law or you're acting because of your interests. I actually think it's more complicated than that. 
And so the fact that the Russian ambassador is engaging in rhetoric and is using international law, to my mind, is still significant. He's using international law in order to appeal to the states that don't want to take a side to encourage them not to take a side. So I wouldn't make the claim that it's determining what is going on is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. A word we haven't yet heard much about tonight is cyber security. Um, many of us sat wondering when the war in Ukraine, when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, whether we would be instantly subject Must be. There we go. <laughs> um, indeed, I came straight to work and said to the colleague I'm about to introduce, uh, it's clear that British Airways has been attacked within 12 hours of cancelling its flights to Russia. They're, they're all, their, all their internet services have just gone down. My wise colleague, the founder of Britain's National Cybersecurity Centre for GCHQ here in, the, here in Britain, um, just looked at me and said, no, no, trust me, that's British Airways incompetence. <laughs> um, and he will explain why in a moment. But we're very lucky to have Kieran Martin here in the school as a full-time professor of practice, described when we hired him as the best civil servant of his generation. Um, he not only founded the National Cybersecurity Centre, but prior to that was the Constitution uh, Director um, in the British government, which is why you, we see Kieran popping up on television and radio all the time, and it's usually either cybersecurity, calming the masses sometimes, or it's, um, it's on constitutional affairs in, in Britain. Kieran, last week it would seem you were in Australia, mm. and um, you were quoted as saying, for the long-term strategic sustainability of Western industrial capability for free and open technology, we need an alliance of democratic countries that work together to plan outcomes that are consistent with markets and competition and so on. And I just wonder, is, is that a little bit heroically optimistic about Western democracies staying open in technology markets in the way they've been? Aren't we seeing them all move to a slightly more nationalistic approach, a slightly more, an ever closer friend shoring? Is the legislation and funding we've seen in the United States an indication of that? And, and if that's the case, what's the backup plan? Well, it might be, Nairi. I've only got two points, so apologies for my yep. low point. <laughs> um, uh, and I think, I mean, in terms of that question, um, the new Prime Minister, the latest Prime Minister, has a, um, uh, has a much pithier phrase for it, which is a technological NATO, as he used in his campaign. So it's just worth bearing that in mind, whether you agree with it or not, as a sort of pithier way of, 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 of thinking about it. But I think it plays to, uh, to two points. One is sort of tech security as it has been and is currently and tech security as it's becoming um, and will be in the future. And the first, you know, as it has been and um, broadly is now, is about the internet largely built by the American private sector. And how it's becoming and how it will be is about the US-China battle for technological uh, supremacy. Both of them are rooted into, I think, uh, an absence, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I'm noting it as a fact, an absence of the type of governance and international frameworks that you might expect for something of this importance. To go back to the point that the Chancellor made, the Chancellor of the University, not the one putting up all our taxes, the, um, the, the, the Chancellor only talked about, you know, were we living in a Congress of Vienna moment back in the sort of 90s and uh, post-Congress of Vienna moment? And that's, of course, when the internet took off. And you had this, it was part of the end of history narrative. Um, you know, you had this free, open, communicative uh, nirvana that was going to sweep uh, all before it. And what people don't realize, um, or I think are two things, one is broadly realized, one isn't. Uh, the people who were doing this were engineers who did not envisage it taking off in the way that it did. You, talk, you look at the people who wrote the protocols, which still to this day route internet traffic, and they said, we didn't think it was the foundations of the modern economy. We were engineers, nobody asked us to. And the other is the way it was governed, and it was governed by committees of engineers on a voluntary basis with sometimes formal, sometimes informal, sometimes no relations with the 
uh, with the US uh, government. Some of the most important bodies in the world on internet governance to this day are voluntary associations where you can get things adopted, and I'm not making this up, you can get things adopted by humming. Um, so we have this um, sort of technological uh, edifice um, without security in mind, very uh, lightly uh, governed, and so it's full of vulnerabilities. Um, they're not always, they're not mostly catastrophic vulnerabilities. Um, uh, you, um, to quote rather than bounce uh, Sir Patrick Sanders, uh, when it comes to state-on-state -state conflict, as he said in a very good speech at uh, the Royal United Services Institute in June, you can't cyber your way up a river. Um, uh, you, um, uh, you, you, you can't conquer a country with cyber, you can't sort of take it out, but you can do an awful lot, as he went on to say, you can do an awful lot of harassment and intimidation uh, through cyberspace. So this morning I was at the Defence Academy in Shrivenham, not far from here, and the Foreign Office in the UK has put on a really good programme for young uh, cyber uh, national security leaders from the Western Balkans. And unnoticed in this country largely, both the governments of Albania and Montenegro have in the past six months really struggled to function because of two different types of cyber harassment. Uh, Albania, a couple of months ago, became the first country to sever diplomatic relations with another country, Iran, over cyber attacks. Uh, Iran was deeply unhappy about Albania's um, cooperation and support for Israel, started to do pretty mediocre standard but harassing uh, attacks which stopped Albanian government systems from functioning and Albania re retaliated as such. In Montenegro, you have a government with a very limited capability in this space that doesn't actually know whether its um, ability to function has been compromised by the Russian state or by criminals acting within Russia, which of course are two different things. In Australia, it's really interesting at the minute, the Australian population is terrified at the minute because its largest medical insurer has been um, breached by criminals which the Australian government have said are operating explicitly from within Russia, not directed by the state, and they're leaking incredibly sensitive uh, medical records. So you can see this sort of uh, um, uh, harassment. And before the invasion, if you go back 14 months, I think, to the Biden-Putin summit in Geneva, top of uh, Biden's list briefed out to the media was not Russian state cyber attacks, it was the harboring of uh, criminals damaging healthcare, damaging, you know, leaking data as they're doing in Australia, uh, disrupting you know, uh, energy supplies uh, harbored from within Russia. And we just don't really know how to, uh, 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 how to deal with that. And even in the context of you know, um, uh, the internet built by the US, one of the most fascinating things I think that illustrates the point is that at the start of the war, and you can look this up, it didn't get nearly as much coverage as you might have expected. The Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine wrote to a body called ICANN, which assigns all the names and numbers, the .mil, .gov, etc., etc. And Ukraine formally asked ICANN to disconnect Russia from the internet, essentially. Um, disconnect .ru, which is the English script, and .rf, the Cyrillic. Um, what is really interesting about that is that um, ICANN, which is a committee of civilian, mostly engineers, volunteers from all over the world, etc., very loosely governed, could have said yes, and that would have had that impact. Uh, they took advice, they said no, um, but interestingly, people who are much more familiar with the way ICANN works than, that, than I am said what was extraordinary about it was the fact that they got organized to give an answer in a timely way. They're just not <laughs> configured, they're just not configured to do that. And I think it's really interesting to think about um, you know, we have no ways at the moment for dealing with large-scale, hugely damaging uh, organized cybercrime, state-on-state harassment, but even, you know, something as fundamental as that. So that's just as we have it now. We then turn to, there's a very um, popular phrase amongst um, British national security uh, officials, um, Sir Patrick Mino, who coined it, I don't, but when it comes to tech security, Russia is bad weather and China is climate change. And this comes back to the end of the 90s and that sort of period when, you know, if you look back to some of the writings in the 90s about what was um, uh, about the Chinese state's attitude towards this emerging technology, uh, there seems to be a lot of evidence that you know, quite a lot of its leaders were quite scared of its implications. That didn't last very long. You know, they've mastered it. And unlike Russia, Russia cheats on America's internet. China's kind of built its own and it's very good, and it's quite effective, and it's cheap, and it's exportable, and, that, um, and, there are now, uh, and it's much easier to exert state control uh, over it. And so now we have, in effect, and this is to your point, Nairi, about um, President Biden's CHIPS Act, 
uh, we now have two technospheres in competition with each other. One, the American model, adapted and getting a bit more nationalistic, but I wouldn't think in not quite as nationalistic and bordered in the way that, um, that you're talking about. And the Chinese one, and they're chasing each other across the world, looking for domination and so forth. And now they, um, not least because of um, uh, measures initiated by Trump, but completely turbocharged by Biden, so this is bipartisan, uh, they, are, they are now splitting. So, um, again, within the last two months, there has been an exodus of American tech engineers from China uh, because they are under potential criminal sanction in their home country if they continue cooperating with, uh, China, with Chinese IP. So we have gone from, if you like, slightly chaotic, disorganized computer network security on America's internet, which we still haven't fixed, by the way, to a struggle for tech supremacy. And this is to the point about uh, cooperation. Um, defense cooperation in terms of systems of government is quite easy. Have a summit. If it's a NATO summit, there's a standing bureaucracy to implement it. There are defense ministries that can talk to each other and collaborate. There, there are difficulties in doing it, but we know how to do security cooperation. This is basically economics and trade and a bunch of social policy, and it's much, much harder to do. Um, how do you sustain, if you are looking after the West interests, for example, um, how do you sustain that industrial tech uh, base when it's based on free market um, uh, 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 competition against a sort of planned um, uh, tech um, expansion in China? So that is where this is now going to, where it's not really about computer network security anymore. It's about control of infrastructure. It's about the cables. It's about the raw materials, the metals, the energy supplies, and all the things needed to run technology. Thank you. Kieran, can I um, take just... I know we're just about out of time, but if I can take a couple of questions from the audience, um, and I'll, I'm going to take them both and then um, invite some comments before we close. Yes, over here. Just a few uh, quick questions. One is, um, you know, the conflict in Ukraine has added a new dimension to the war strategy, uh, the drones war. That is, so I was wondering what Tom's take on that. And the second one is, despite North Korea, Taiwan, and South China seas are still there, I was wondering if this conflict in Ukraine has diverted the attention back to European continent again. And finally, um, last winter when the uh, invasion of Ukraine has started, there was much crying out about energy issues, but we are just at the, uh, at the doorstep of another winter, yet um, there's not much complaint about energy. Uh, has the West solved this energy issue? Mm -hmm. Thank you for those questions. I'm not sure we're going to answer them all, but they're great <laughs> questions. There was one other uh, person here that was going to ask a question. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, Amir Ibrahim here. Um, I have a question regard to Professor uh, Martins regarding the commoditization of data and looking at a Western liberal model whereby market forces may look to effectively create stakeholder of capitalism or that form of governance. What challenges do you see in a world where China, particularly with its growing clout in, across Asia, across Africa, potentially exporting its form of data governance there? And is there a clash between the, the commoditization of data and, again, a state-controlled data model that we may see in China in the future? And then, without at all ambushing him, um, Steve, and you're welcome to say no, but did you ha would, would, would you share a comment on um, Kieran's point about the technology competition between the United States and China. You've been somebody who has lived um, a, a vibrant sense of both cooperation and competition with China. Do you, is, that, is that remaining possible, do you, or do you think we're going to end up with the two separate technology spheres, and that will make both competition and cooperation more difficult? I think at the moment that's the, an easy yes mm. uh, for an answer. Um, you know, China took a very aggressive uh, position, uh, I guess it was about six years ago, uh, when they, they basically for some reason decided to circulate their strategic plan on technology 
why they did it as a mystery to me because it got translated and everybody read it who was relevant to read it and they talked about dominating, uh, I guess it was seven categories of technology from AI to quantum, et cetera, et cetera. And they just laid it all out and uh, apparently the word dominate was the correct interpretation uh, uh, of Chinese. And, and so that, that laid the game out uh, and that's one of the reasons why you had this huge escalation uh, between the two countries. Be because if you take a world, and I, I'm not an expert the way the people are uh, on, on the podium or the uh, chief of staff, uh, but in a simplistic way, uh, if somebody is going to dominate those technologies, the military applications of those uh, uh, are, are pretty, overwhelming because machines move faster than people. Uh, and so, so this is a proximate threat uh, to, to balance of power. Uh, and, and consequently, there, there was a, a, a major reaction by the people who felt that they were gonna be on the losing end of that potentially, which are the Western powers. Uh, and, and so they've responded uh, to that um, big time. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so so I, I think this is like a game on, uh, which is an American expression, uh, you know, and I don't know that that's gonna stop and what a trigger for stopping conceivably would be. Thank you. In fact, um, that in the commercial world, there are some of the things they're doing. Uh, for example, the enormous success of uh, uh, TikTok, uh, which you know a lot of people, kids use and so forth, came out of no place. Their, their ability to develop the AI protocols for that were pretty stunning, actually, if you talk to commercial people. Uh, the top people in, in, in the world uh, and, and just sort of looked at that technology after you know there was a potential sale of that business and went, OMG, uh, I am like really, I thought I was good. I'm sort of close to no place. So that, that's, that's the reality of that world. Right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you Thank for you. the cold call. Again, yeah. It's, 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 it's been since my first year at business school that somebody <laughs> did that to me. So um, aware that the five of us are the one thing standing between you and drinks and refreshments in the seminar rooms, um, let me just ask the panelists if there's any sentence they would like to <laughs> conclude with. Um, Tom. Just the drones question very quickly. Um, we military observers are obviously very much thinking about what the impacts might be on the battle battle space. So there will be areas like increased air defence that's required to combat this threat. But I think actually the deeper lesson is that when you put a new uh, tool in the toolbox, what it actually does is it increases the rewards that go to the person, or in this case the organisation, that knows how to use all the tools together. So the hardest thing to do in military operations is combined arms operations, where you bring together air power, tanks, artillery, all the different platforms and systems that exist to create focused effects. And the military that is able to do that on the battlefield will dominate it and will win. And drones add another opportunity for that. So the lesson we've actually seen on Ukraine from a battlefield perspective is just the, the old one, which is that militaries which train hard and uh, effectively and are not corrupt, succeed. Thank you, Tom. Kieran. Um, just quickly um, to the points directed at me. On the data economy uh, side, I mean, I think the Western model needs a lot of cleaning up, frankly, and um, you know, to the TikTok point, there have been all sorts of questions about its relations with the state, but 
you know, hostile states can get quite a lot of our data quite easily uh, um, uh, anyway. There is a point about its use in practicing AI. But uh, to the point about, um, um, to um, Mr. Schwartzman's point about um, the Chinese government's strategy, I mean, it was an extraordinary thing, and it's quite an interesting point if you're looking at China and the US and the tech tensions and competitions about the tools of statecraft. So China, I mean, has this strategy. Weirdly, as you say, it published it in perfect English um, and designed to sort of terrify. But if you, it's, it's made in China 20, 2025, published in 2015, is really worth still reading as, um, as a coherent and if you're in a Western security organization, slightly terrifying um, uh, vision. Um, but then, you know, the US's response um, has been in part to weaponize its commercial legal system and intellectual property law. And that's what's been happening with the, the sanctions and so forth, which really, really are biting. And I would finish on the point, you will, as an economist now, of course, no one loved the famous Larry Summers remark about if he were to come back, he'd want, um, or, or was it uh, James Carville, if he wanted to come back, he'd come back as the bond markets, because then you could terrify everybody. In my field, <laughs> if I wanted to come back, I'd want to come back as the US Department of Commerce's legal division, because then you can just control Western technology. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Dapo, anything to finish on? Yeah, there's a question directed at me online, which asked about um, reparations um, post-conflict. So Tom had a speculation about what might happen post-conflict. And I think in the legal sphere, there are going to be two interesting things to think about um, at the end of the one. One is this question of reparations. To what extent might it be possible to construct a regime for reparations in a scenario where, you know, it's inconceivable that we're going to see a sort of total defeat of Russia like we've seen in other cases. And the second one is going to be the question around what do we do with respect to the prosecution for international crime. So at the moment, there's a lot of focus and energy on investigating international crimes and what are we going to see there. On the reparations question, it's going to revolve really around this question of to what extent I think it's most unlikely that we're going to see Russia actually paying reparations. The question is to what extent can you use Russian assets, of which there are a lot in other countries, for uh, the purpose of, of paying reparations. And then on the war crimes issue, one of the really interesting things that we're seeing is a sort of total turnaround in the US position with respect to the International Criminal Court. The US had previously taken the view that the International Criminal Court does not have jurisdiction over nationals of state that are not parties to the ICC, because the US is not a party, but Russia is also not a party. And now we see total US support <laughs> for prosecutions of nationals of a state that are not a party to, um, um, to, to the statute of the International Criminal Court. It'd be interesting to see whether the US maintains that position beyond the end of the, the conflict. Thank you, Dafo. Nita. Yeah, I actually want to talk about the lessons from the Ukraine that we, that we haven't touched upon because I think um, what you see with Ukraine is a relatively small force assisted by many civilians in a coordinated strategy which they developed over several years was able to, to slow down, um, stop, and turn back a military that, that uh, NATO and the US prepared to fight in a much different way, which raises the question for me of whether uh, all of the Cold War doctrine, air, land, battle, et cetera, was overprepared, hmm. overinsured, and overspent, and that the idea of increasing by 1% here and um, you know many billions in the US and elsewhere spending and then, then going through modernization on a model that uh, is going to d that is prepared to fight a much weakened Russia seems to me to be a point where we ought to reconsider. Um, in other words, the we don't the, the reaction to this current conflict may be again another round of overinsuredness, overpreparedness um, to fight a military that could be stopped w with much uh, less expense and different tactics. Well, thank you. Look, we've seen tonight that global security has several dimensions that as we build a program here at the school, we're going to have to be thinking about and working with colleagues across Oxford and beyond 
to, to resolve from the military dimensions, the cybersecurity dimensions, the international law dimensions, the climate dimensions, and those that some of your questions have raised. Um, there couldn't be a better person to be naming this chair after than somebody who's lead, who, who leads by navigating some of the most complex uh, um, and, and, and um, complex and difficult um, situations and organizations. And uh, Louise Richardson, we are really honored to be naming this chair and this program after you, and thank you once again for that. And then we're incredibly grateful to a number of people in this room who have helped support this chair and have made it possible. And I do want to end with my favorite quote from one of them. Um, Steve Schwartzman in 2019 wrote a book called What It Takes. And if you're ever flagging in your energy or enthusiasm or your you know, appui into what you're doing. Pick up Steve's book and take a read. It's sort of like having a vitamin injection. But Steve gives you some helpful pointers at the end, but the number one, and it really is the number one because it reverberates right through the whole book and through what Steve does and the way he does it, is this. He tells you, he tells us, it's as easy to do something big as it is to do something small. So reach for a fantasy worthy of your pursuit with rewards commensurate to your effort. And Steve, when I think about what we need to do in the face of the complexity and intensity of global security, I think we need your number one, <laughs> um, your number one tip um, right in the forefront of our minds. So I'd like to close and invite you all um, um, to join us in the seminar rooms with a huge vote of thanks to those who are making the chair possible, to the Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor for their uh, leadership, along with other colleagues here tonight um, of this institution. And then if you could join me in thanking my colleagues for giving you a taster of the dimensions of global security that we're all going to be grappling with over the next few years. Thank you all very much.